Ghislaine Maxwell has been sentenced to 20 years in prison over sex trafficking offences. The British socialite was convicted in December for helping Jeffrey Epstein sexually abuse four girls between the years 1994 and 2004. For more reaction now, we're joined live from New York by the CNN reporter Jean Caceres. Jean, can you bring us up to speed? What a day it was. It was a long day. It was almost an all-day uh, proceeding, and we thought it was going to be relatively short, but Ghislaine Maxwell was there. She was in a navy blue prison jumpsuit. She had uh, shackles around her ankles. U.S. Marshals would be by her side if she would walk at all. But the judge, in pronouncing the sentence, said that it had to be significant. Now, the prosecutor, the U.S. Attorney's Office, had wanted 30 to 55 but the judge ruled 20 based upon the sentencing guidelines at the time. But the judge also said what was significant to her was there was really never any acceptance of responsibility during the course of the pleadings at all and thought that was important. Also, she wanted to make sure everyone realized, especially Maxwell, that she was being sentenced for her conduct, not the conduct of Jeffrey Epstein. Now, it's interesting because I think people were shocked when Maxwell herself stood up and walked to the podium to deliver an allocution before the court. But she was really, I think, speaking to the victims, because here's a, an example of some of the things she said. She said, I am sorry for the pain you've experienced. I hope the conviction brings you closure. I had hoped this day would bring a terrible chapter to an end. May this day help you travel from the darkness into the light. And she also said that it was difficult to address the victims and the court because of the emotion that had been in that courtroom as the victims gave their victim impact statements. Russian President Vladimir Putin has reacted to G7 leaders who mocked his macho image. The leaders, if you recall, earlier this week made fun of his tendency to pose topless in photos, right? Well, Vladimir Putin says they would look disgusting, shirtless, and even had some advice to share. Everything must be harmonically developed in a man, both the body and soul. But for everything to be harmonious, it's necessary to stop abusing alcohol and other bad habits, do physical exercise and take part in sports. All the colleagues you just mentioned, I know them personally. We are currently not in the best period of our relationship. But nevertheless, they are leaders, meaning they have character. And if they want, they can surely achieve the desired success. And China is criticising the Prime Minister following warnings over military action in the South China Sea. Mr Albanese had told Beijing to take note of Russia's failed invasion of Ukraine when it came to its own ambitions for Taiwan. China's state-owned news outlet China Daily says the comments disrupted efforts to repair the relationship, saying it is hard to believe that the new Australian leader can be so ill-informed as to not know China's stance on the Ukraine crisis or that he can be so ignorant as not to understand the status of Taiwan. China also denounced Australia's reaction to its discussions with the Solomon Islands and for supporting America's alternative to China's Belt and Road Initiative. Joining us live now is the Acting Prime Minister, Richard Miles. Richard, good to see you. Thanks for your time this morning. So, as you heard there, China argues Anthony Albanese has undermined the prospect of a reset of our relationship with China. Is that the case? Well, Anthony has been articulating Australia's national interest, which is what he's been consistently doing uh, over, uh, for, for a long time um, and, and which we will continue to do. Um, and, and we've made really clear that, that we are going to speak up for uh, Australia's national interests, and e even when that is obviously differing from uh, Chinese action. And the point about uh, referencing the war in the Ukraine is that while it's a long way from Australia, the principles and the issues at stake in that conflict uh, are ones that are very significant for, the, for Australia and apply right around the world, which is essentially that we need to be supporting the global rules-based order. We need to be supporting a, a world which is based on rules. It's, it, the UN Charter doesn't allow a, a big country to just march in on another one because they're unhappy. Uh, and, and it's very important that we're standing with Ukraine now. And, and that principle, which applies in East Europe, uh, applies in, Indo, in the Indo-Pacific as well and right around the world.
The Chinese Foreign Ministry is criticising both NATO and the G7 for attacking its policies and human rights record. The group of seven nations met in Germany earlier this week for its annual summit calling on China to use its influence with Russia to stop the Ukraine war. World leaders also took aim at Beijing's expansive maritime claims in the South China Sea. Spokesperson for the Chinese Foreign Ministry responded to their discontent, saying G7 countries only make up 10% of the world's population. They have no right to represent the world or to think their values and standards should apply to the world. China is accusing both the G7 and NATO of having a Cold War mentality and creating tension, saying... What they should do is give up their Cold War mindset, zero-sum games and stop doing things that create enemies. NATO's formally classified China as a threat. It's called it malicious by expanding nuclear capabilities in secret. It's definitely some of the most aggressive language, shall we say, that NATO's used on China. What, what do you make of it? Oh, look, I think this is a very significant set of developments coming out of the NATO summit, Peter, because I think, you know, the, the, this is the new NATO strategic concept. It sets the directions for the world's biggest alliance for the next decade. They've, of course, very much focused, as you've said, on, on Russia and its invasion of Ukraine, but they've also linked that closely to China. As you said, they've, called, they've described China as a strategic and security challenge. Uh, it is, I think, the start of a bit of a new era in uh, global strategic affairs with NATO kind of positioning itself at the lead of a global coalition against the alliance between uh, Russia and China. I guess the question I've got, uh, I, I ask is, w w where does this lead? What exactly is mm. NATO going to do about it? Uh, what's the end game they're looking for? And I think those big questions still remain to be answered. Mr Anthony Albanese has arrived in Madrid ahead of the NATO Leaders' Summit. Russia's invasion of Ukraine and China's growing regional influence expected to top the agenda when the official talks get underway. Later in the week, he'll head to Paris for a meeting with the French President Emmanuel Macron in a bid to repair relations after reaching a settlement on the scrapped submarine deal. It's also rumoured that the PM will visit the Ukrainian capital of Kiev after an invitation was extended by President Volodymyr Zelensky. He says he's taking security advice on that decision. It's a big trip uh, for Anthony Good Albanese, morning. this one. What do you expect to come out of it? Well, look, I think the fact that Australia has its Prime Minister attending demonstrates the solidarity that the Western world has come together with over the last, uh, you know, six to nine months around Ukraine. But even uh, your own uh, packages a little earlier talked about the Arctic and the militarisation of the Arctic. You've mm. got China's increased aggression in the South <clears throat> China Sea. So I think never in, in 50 years have we seen quite the activity that that pact where they're going to support each other between China and Russia has, has changed the uh, situation, the, the global strategic discussion. So for Albo to be there and to lend weight to we are with the democratic Western countries is just a very important symbol. Yeah, and, that, and that's... I, I, uh, I hope he gets a chance. Just some re final reflections here as Minister for Women, Katie, on, uh, on Roe v Wade. Is there any chance, some people might be concerned about this um, looking forward, is there any chance that Australia and its states reverse their position? Well, I think the message out of America over the weekend for Roe versus Wade is that um, women around the world have to remain vigilant about access to safe and legal abortion and to laws that protect uh, their rights to, um, to access healthcare services. Um, it's, you know, it's only in the last 20 years or so that uh, state and territory parliaments have dealt with this issue and decriminalised it in almost every state and ensured that there's a legal framework for women to access safe and legal abortion. Um, and, you know, I think what we saw in America reverberating around the world is a major setback on, mm. on women's rights to access health care. And I think vigilance is the key. But I would also say this hasn't been front and centre of Australian politics, and that's a good thing. This matter has been dealt with at states and territories, and there's laws in place uh, to protect women going through mm. this very difficult process. Do Treasurer Jim Chalmers has warned inflation will be significantly higher than expected, backing the Reserve Bank's latest assessment. Inflation grew to 5.1% in March, its highest level since 2007, but soaring commodity prices and supply chain shortages fuelled by the war in Ukraine has led the RBA to predict that inflation will reach as high as 7% before the end of the year. The Treasurer, who will deliver a budget update when Parliament resumes next month, 
has backed those warnings. Well, inflation will be significantly higher uh, than what was expected in the last government's most recent budget, what mm. was expected at election time as well, certainly higher than the 5.1% we saw in the March quarter. Uh, this inflation problem will get more difficult. The Reserve Bank has said something around 7%. That doesn't seem to me to be wildly off the mark. Sydney's auction market has recorded another weak result. Just 55% of those held over the weekend were sold. The executive chairman of... Yellow Brick Road Home Loans, Mark Burris, joins us live now. I suppose this was inevitable, Mark, but uh, it's quite a drop. It is quite a drop, since, uh, like if you can compare it to a year ago. And if you look at the national levels outside of Sydney, just national levels, we're looking at a 59% clearance rate against what was this time last year, May last year, I should say, 75% or close to 75%. But, Pete, let's not read too much into this. They're saying the clearance at the auction... But what we've got to remember, there's a lot of times if you're the highest bidder, you then have the opportunity to negotiate with your uh, vendor outside of the auction room. And I was talking to a whole lot of agents last night. I went to dinner with a number of 15 real estate agents last night out of various franchises. And they were telling me still there is high, there is high clearance rate after the auction. In other words, the, they don't reach the reserve, but they sell it at a price below the vendor's expectations. But nonetheless, they are selling. Baby boomers, time at the centre of policy debate may soon be coming to an end. The latest census data out today shows they're being matched in numbers by millennials for the first time. The Australian Bureau of Statistics is about to release the first tranche of data from the 2021 census today. Data shows boomers and millennials now account for 21.5% of all residents. The population is also becoming less religious the proportion of Christians dropping below 50% for the first time ever. 39% of Australians now identify as non-religious, up from 30% in 2016. And interesting data that I found this morning too, Dan, is that there's so much more people or so many more people coming from India now at the top of the list. There is, Pete, and once again, I think it shows there's real opportunities for us uh, with our relationship with India. And one of the things, you know, I'd say immediately to the Albanese government is we've got a free trade agreement with India, which has been signed, waiting to be ratified. There's nothing um, stopping that coming into force tomorrow, uh, except that we need the parliament back and we need action on it. And, uh, you know, there's a real opportunity for us to be able to cement that growing relationship mm. with India. Uh, we've seen the importance of the Indian community here in Australia, the growing importance. Uh, we can use those strong people to people links uh, through that FTA to really enhance the relationship between both countries. And uh, it, it's just sitting there waiting for the government to act. And once again, I call on Don Farrell, the Trade Minister, uh, get on with it, Don. Uh, we need this in force as soon as we possibly can.